Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Thursday conversation with the Bridge Conference Ministers. I'm here with my colleagues to talk about phasing forward, how as we think about um, the, the process by which our churches will come to back together in physical spaces, what that will look like. And we're going to have some conversation among ourselves. We're going to encourage you to also join in on the conversation, asking questions um, in the chat box, either if you are joining us by Zoom um, in the chat box there, or if you're on Facebook Live, we'll also be monitoring that platform for any questions or comments that you might have. So thank you all for joining us. Um, we're going to start with a three, three parts of scripture that sort of ground and shape and form our thinking about phasing forward as the Southern New England Conference of the United Church of Christ. The first scripture is, all of these should be well known to most of us, I would guess. The first is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 44. Then they also will answer. Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And the prophet Jeremiah in the 29th chapter verse 7 says this, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. And finally, from the book of Acts, part of the Pentecost story in the second chapter of Acts, verse 46. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. So those three scriptures have helped form our ideas, thoughts, and recommendations for the Southern New England Conference, and you'll hear more about that in a minute. But I'd like to pray a prayer um, that is from Barbara Glasson, the president of the Methodist Conference, and it's a prayer for the Christian community. So let us pray. We are not people of fear. We are people of courage. We are not people who protect our own safety. We are people who protect our neighbor's safety. We are not people of greed. We are people of generosity. We are your people, God, giving and loving wherever we are, whatever it costs for as long as it takes, wherever you call us. Amen. So I'd like to turn our conversation over to my colleague, Marilyn. Marilyn. Good afternoon. I have some announcements for the good of the order this afternoon. Um, as you know, we have canceled the June annual meeting, uh, but we do need to meet as a conference. So we have scheduled a tentative date for the next uh, gathering for September 26th. So save the date. Our annual meeting planning team is making plans for a virtual meeting that day. Our uh, RIP medical debt deadline is fast approaching. It's this coming Monday, May the 18th. Uh, we've well over $125,000 so far and that will allow us to retire millions of dollars in crushing medical debt that can bring a family to bankruptcy. So if your church hasn't contributed, please do so in the next few days. All of the money that is raised will go to that effort. The Council of Conference Ministers of the United Church of Christ, including we three Bridge Conference Ministers, have collaborated to create an entire Sunday worship it uses the revised common lectionary reading for this coming Sunday, May 17th, but you can use it for any other Sunday later on if you like. The project team is currently working to enable closed captioning uh, and they hope to have it ready by Sunday. So if you've already downloaded the worship service 
and wish to have closed captions, uh, be sure to get the latest version. And then my colleague, Ken Salati, will be hosting a webinar tomorrow at two o'clock entitled Digital Ministry, What We've Learned and What's Next. It will be tomorrow at 2 p.m. Uh, we have some worship leaders from around the conference to discuss what they've learned so far about doing digital ministry and where we, they believe we are headed. The panel will include Jonathan Chapman, Anna Flowers, Isaac Lawson, Jen Macy, Ashley Popperson, and Alex Shea Will. So this is not to be missed. Uh, you can find the link in the five things to know email or in the events uh, tab, uh, tab on our website, uh, sneucc.org. Um, you can also catch it at 2 p.m. tomorrow on the conference's Facebook page. And I think that's all I have for today. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Don. Good afternoon. I'm going to recap one of the scriptures and share with you the introduction from a document that has been developed by the people I'm about to introduce, along with the help of a variety of people on our staff. That scripture comes from Jeremiah 29, 7. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and prayed to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. This is the introduction. This is a time unlike anything we have experienced in our lifetimes. This is a challenging time for all of us. We have had moments of creative ingenuity and moments of overwhelming exhaustion. We entered it in chaos. We plan to move through it with intention. We are not reopening because we never closed. We have engaged ministry in new ways and we will move forward in new ways. First, there is no way to ensure the overall safety of our congregations and communities until there is a trusted vaccine. We know this. Second, we know that in-person worship in sanctuaries is one of the types of gatherings that is most likely to spread the viral infection. In an enclosed room, over a length of time, the airborne viral particles can reach every corner, and six foot or 12 foot physical distancings will not prevent this. Speaking and praying and singing aloud, which is so much a part of our worship, propels the virus even further than just breathing. Using masks limits, but does not prevent the transmission of the disease. And in our worship spaces, in our churches, common surfaces abound with the opportunity for lots of contact. And we know that people can be carriers of the virus without showing any symptoms. Third, we don't know everything about the virus and its impact on all ages. New information is coming out literally daily. That makes it hard to predict trends and safety measures and even the phases we're presenting. Fourth, our congregations in many cases are, com are comprised of the populations most vulnerable to COVID-19. And fifth, an outbreak in one of our churches will have an impact upon all of our communities and upon the capacity of our healthcare systems. So we've been reviewing dozens of documents and websites on next steps for places of worship. The document you're about to see and will soon be on the website is an integration and distillation of those resources tailored for our churches. We are presenting it in a phasing forward approach, beginning with our current base phase, the phase we're in right now, and moving through four phases that are tied to local conditions and the guidance of local government and healthcare professionals. So let me share with you three points that comes from this. There is no one date that can be universally applied across our conference to every church and every community. Things differ. Local regulations, building size and condition, the age of the congregation, the size of the congregation, the healthcare capacity in the community, the rate and incidence of the spread in that community, those are all changing from town to town. Second, the way forward we know is not gonna be linear. There is a possibility of new spikes of infection that may return us back into the base phase or the stay home, stay safe requirements. So based on all of this, 
based on these phases, these metrics, and these guidance, and the current trends that we are seeing at this point, we believe that in-person worship in buildings will need to be suspended most likely through the at least the end of the summer. So I want to share with you the three folks who have been working most diligently on this particular document. Kate Ostertag, Tamara Moreland, and Kelly Gallagher. They've all are a part of our staff and they have been collecting the insight and wisdom from across our staff and across our country. I'm going to turn it over to Kelly. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, great to be here. It, I wish I could see all your faces. Um, I'm Kelly Gallagher, uh, Associate Conference Minister for the Central Massachusetts and Franklin Associations. Um, I'm grateful to be with everyone. I just want to say, um, I'm here to say that uh, we began a couple weeks ago um, looking at this idea of what are our next steps. We put out um, a list, a checklist for the mid-pandemic filled with questions inviting all of you to start asking as we consider moving forward. The more that Tamara and Kate and I read documents coming out of states and um, the CDC, we moved into the understanding of phases, which we are going to present to you and which Don just talked about. Um, we are not experts on this. We are, um, we are here to work and serve and gather and hear and talk and share with all of you. We welcome continued resources and conversation, uh, your questions, your concerns. Um, what we'll present today uh, is um, an outline. There will be more resources on the website, but we are showing you a snapshot of what we are recommending um, for our uh, phase forward um, recommendations. We took into consideration the vast array of churches that we have, the reality of three states and many counties and many, many local considerations. Um, and so we're offering general recommendations and we hope that it will be useful for many. Um, and again, we welcome your resources that you have to share with us as we go forward. And so I will turn it over to um, Kate Ostertag, who has um, put together this amazing document. So thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm just going to walk you through the basic outline of the document. Um, beginning with the base phase. I believe that Tiffany's going to get that up on your screen so that you can see it. The base phase is where we are right now. We're in a either a stay-at-home order or non-essential business recommendations are in place. And it's really clear that the case count, the COVID-19 case count, is not decreasing and not decreasing over the two-week continuous span that it would need to in order to move into one of the actual phases where we could begin in-person worship. Um, we have some recommendations that are specific to base phase um, that include online worship only, um, online meetings only, and then spending this time to make the preparations um, for phasing forward. Um, those preparations uh, include continuing to use the resources like the resources that we have on the website already, the mid-pandemic checklist that was mentioned, continuing to review the CDC guidelines, and including those that are the interim guidelines for communities of faith, continue to monitor your churches while they're closed to see that there aren't any risks that should um, be attended to. You'll want to consider and plan what the requirements you have for uh, worship leaders that will participate in in-person worship during the pandemic. You'll need a plan to develop. You'll need to develop a plan for that in-person worship. And it will be consider ta a considerable task load. You want to appoint an administrator or maybe develop a task team. There'll be a protocol that needs to be followed that will need to be implemented and you'll need that task team to put that forth. You'll need policies for uh, health and health screening. And what will you do in the event of a case inside your community? There'll need to be an initial deep cleaning and then there'll need to be ongoing sanitation plans. And of course, you'll wanna share and develop a communication system to share with your, worship, with your worshipers every, all those measures that you're planning, taking, and as they are adjusted. 
as we look at moving into phase one, and you'll notice the phases are very similar. What defines moving forward in phase is a longer period of time where you've been successful at worshiping in person and able to maintain those case counts staying down or trending down for longer and longer periods of time. So in our phase one, first and foremost, you've done all the work that is needs to be done through the recommendations in the base phase. And you have confirmed that your state and local governments have lifted those stay at home orders or essential business recommendations. But in addition to that, check with your local health agent, make sure that you meet the criteria, that your case counts have been declining for continuous two weeks, that there's widespread available testing, and that personal protective equipment is available, that there's not any shortages in place. We start out in a small numbers, 10 to 25 people, and that includes your lay and clergy leadership. And that should probably be prepared, that should definitely be paired with online worship. It's probably not gonna include your whole congregation and there'll be people who have risk factors and won't be able to join in. Um, you'll wanna follow all the in-person in guidelines and recommendations. Those will be available online and they do include no singing and no communion. You'll wanna schedule it far enough out once it appears that you're able to move forward that you'll be able to do a dress rehearsal. They'll, uh, nothing will be familiar to the people arriving and people's roles will have changed. Continue holding online worship and encourage those that are at high risk to continue to worship online. Look at holding services outside in well-ventilated areas. Consider some of the ideas that have come up for a drive-in style worship. Uh, if they can be safely organized and always contact your local police and fire departments to check for any local requirements that might be in place. This is a really important piece. The phases as we move into them, we can only move forward or stay in a phase so long as all of the criteria for being in that phase remain true. So if case counts begin to rise or someone in your community tests positive, then it's recommended that you move back to the base phase. Always keeping in mind to post and follow the guidelines for hygiene, social distancing, and continue with only online meetings and church offices would remain closed during this period of time. The remaining phases, well, the remaining two, the next two phases, phase two and phase three, are essentially the same. Although if we move forward, it means that we've developed confidence in meeting in person. We're able to do so safely. Our state and local uh, community is in a downward continuous trend and our community, our worshiping community is in downward trend. So most of what happens is the numbers increase during these periods of phase two and phase three. And when we get to phase four, it means that there is a vaccine, that it is, uh, that we have widespread inoculation that has been successful. And only then when there's widespread immu immunity would we be able to return to in-person worship. And again, a reminder that at any point in time, if we have a reversal of that positive trend, we have to move back to the base phase. Um, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Tamara Moreland, and she's going to help with our wrapping up. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tamara Moreland, and it was a delight to work on this project with Kate and Kelly. And as Kelly said, initially, this is a snapshot of all of the material that we reviewed uh, for this presentation. But I want you to know that uh, we will also be available in the days and weeks ahead to answer questions from you, to gather information from you, and to continue compiling uh, the best information we can for the churches in the Southern New England Conference. And in addition to being available to you, we hope that you will share this information um, once it's posted on our website, which I believe will happen probably tomorrow, that you share this information with your various clergy groups, uh, lay leadership groups, with moderators with uh, communities of practice and with uh, and within meetings that you have so that everyone has a chance to look at this material and see how it can be utilized in your unique church in your community and whatever situations that you may have. 
Um, in addition to this snapshot, there's a lot more that we have, and we couldn't go over all of that today. It was really too much. So the detailed information will be on the website. There's a detailed version of this phase forward. There's also a list of recommendations for in-person worship that are much more detailed than what we discussed today. And I think that will be very helpful for you um, to talk about the real detailed uh, elements that you need to think about um, in your churches. There's also a template for worship. Again, we're not um, mandating that you do this, but we thought it would be helpful to have a template that you can utilize um, in your own churches as you're thinking about how might we do um, worship? You know, how might, what might we do around people sitting and social distancing? And how would we do that if we had coffee hour? How would we do these uh, various things? So there is that template as well. So um, the other thing that we wanted to mention is that our material may be slightly different than others. Um, I think right now people are a little overwhelmed that everybody's putting out uh, a directive for uh, in-person gathering. And so we were very careful to select things and to put together something that reflects our culture, that reflects the theology um, that is pervasive in the United Church of Christ, and um, that complements our culture. So if you hear that other churches are doing different things, uh, we want you to know that that's why we selected these things to present to you. And it may be different than, you know, our neighbors. Um, they have a different theology in some churches and some churches are going to be going back before we do. Um, there's, you know, and, and Kent might speak to that. We had a conversation earlier today that some people are really um, biting at the bit to be in their churches um, as soon as possible. But we've decided to follow these guidelines so that we can be safe and that we can protect those that God has given us, um, not charge over, but that God has placed in our sphere of influence and for us to um, minister to them. So I think that's it. If you want to, if you have any questions, um, I think Kent will share those questions with us and we'd be happy to answer them for you. So lots of kudos for all of this work that the three of you have been doing and have put into this form. Uh, deep appreciation for many people online. Um, one of the questions that's being asked is, who makes decisions about what the widespread availability of testing is? Anybody want to answer that one? Well, Don, would you... oh, no, go, no. Ahead. go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Kelly. Um, I, was, I was actually going to ask Don, it feels um, more like a, a, a CDC or, or uh, because a CDC question or how towns are doing with tracking. Um, so Don, can you speak to that? Uh, one thing I'll speak to is uh, with questions like these, I'm going to keep encouraging you to check with your local health officials they have the best sense of what the requirements are and how those requirements are best met within your particular region because the metrics themselves may change from place to place. They're the ones who will have the best insight into do we have sufficient testing capacity that we feel within our community it's safe to move into a new phase. Consult with them. If you don't have a local health agent, check with your emergency management person in, in the community. Your local police and fire should know who they are. Your local town officials should know the health agent. And you all should know them as well. Get to know them well. So another question is, I'm curious about why worship is the first in-person activity that you recommend rather than beginning with pastoral care, small group meetings, or other in-person activities subject to appropriate distancing, et cetera, and holding off on worship until a later phase. So that's one question about why worship against those other things. And then I'm also interested in any guidance you may have on funerals, weddings, 12-step groups, preschools, and other space use. So let's take one at a time. One is, um, why is worship the first in-person activity that we've mentioned rather than some of the other small pastoral care, small group meetings, other in-person activities? Anybody want to answer that? Um, you want to take a shot at that? Okay. Go ahead, Jim. Kelly and I are on the same rhythm here. Um, I think primarily what we've heard from people is that we really want to get back to worship. 
um, that people have been very creative in small groups and it's a lot easier to do small groups virtually. Um, and so the, the, the pressure or the, the comments from people in our community has really been, I miss being in worship. So our focus was about um, gathering together in worship. But clearly, I think when you look through the documents, it really pertains to all kinds of gatherings, whether it's a funeral, whether it's your meetings and so forth. But our focus initially was on worship. Kelly, you want to add something to that? Um, I, I guess just that I would say that the question of pastoral care and any other kind of gathering, those um, uh, criteria would still exist as they would going to the grocery store. I mean, the, the six feet and the, the mask and the gloves, and, and those are the kinds of things um, that pastors will have to be deciding for themselves. You may choose if you can only gather 10 people, instead of gathering those 10 people for worship, you may see, well, we're going to have study groups all summer to discuss how this has impacted us and our vision. And yet we would still recommend all the things we recommend are for, um, for consideration if you're going to bring 10 people together at all. And they're the six feet, the you will see all the recommendations there are. So whether you're gathered 10 people for worship, 10 people for Bible study, five people to vision, all the things that we've put in place or recommended, we would recommend the same. So the second part of that question is around offering guidance for funerals, weddings, but then that sort of goes into another territory, which is user groups of our congregations, buildings, the 12-step groups, preschools, other space use. Um, any thoughts about that? Kate, I, um, that, the question of the use of the building doesn't uh, come in until I think the end of phase two or three, Kate. I think it's phase two, where we recommend the consideration of opening the building to others. Um, if we recommended it in the in what is now the end of phase two to consider it and to consider implementing it in phase three. Uh, and the conservative logic there is that the sanitation practices that would be required for worship if you proceeded with worship when amplified um, by other building use become quite, quite complex and very quickly uh, multiple entering and exiting from the building. I think if a church perhaps was not going to worship in person, that they might have greater flexibility for building use. Uh, but if the, the space is shared and there would be worship or maybe multiple even um, scheduled times of worship, then to also have rental groups or maintain offices at the same time um, looked uh, pretty, pretty extensive to manage. Uh, so it's not that it's not a conversation that you couldn't try to have earlier, but there is a great complexity. So that was the reason for delaying that some. Hoping to also hear about children and youth programming at each phase and when can staff work from church buildings? Anybody want to speak about children and youth at the phases? Go ahead, Tamara. Kelly. Or you have to unmute. <laughs> so our faith formation folks have worked really hard on um, phasing forward documents around youth and Sunday schools and things like that. And that will be a resource attached to, to our document and on their pages. And so um, that would be another Thursday conversation. They've worked really hard. And so I, that's what I can say. Are there, there, go ahead, I'm sorry, Kelly. Was there another part of that question? Um, it was about when staff can work from church buildings. And I think, again, when church buildings are open uh, is, is listed, I think, the end of phase two as well. Are there plans to help congregations obtain personal protective equipment, specifically hand sanitizer in bulk? I don't think that we've discussed that as mm -hmm. a possibility, but I do think how we might um, talk about what resources congregations might need and how to be, how to get a hold of resources like PPE. Um, I do think we'll probably want to include that in some of our research. So we will we will try to attend to that. Um, 
do you have advice for churches that host other congregations of different traditions within their building? To what extent are we to make the decision about how they return to worship in the building? That's a really good question. Um, because other churches may want to start earlier. Um, there are some places I think where there are meetings that are being held now, but the, the church office itself is closed. And so I think that that requires a sensitive conversation um, with the leaders in the church and those um, folks that are renting the space because they are renting your space or utilizing your space. Um, and so I think you share you know, what your guidelines are and what your practices are and ask that they can adhere to those as best as possible. Is there a central SNEC location where I can direct my church members for this Sunday's worship service? I think that's referring to the council conference ministers worship service. And we will, we will run that on our page on the Sunday mornings, but there also is a link in on the, on the Facebook page. And is that on the website, Tiffany? The, yes. Also on the website. Um, Lots of good questions and responses. The challenge that we have discussed related to a limited small number in worship is how we would politely and with an open heart tell people that they can't come. So any suggestions how to manage that? That's not what's said exactly here, but I think that is the question. We're concerned that the very people who should not come for, because they're in the risk factors, my age group and older, um, will be the people who will want to come. They'll be the ones who have been isolated. Um, how, do you, how would we think that one through? That's also in our recommendation document. Um, but, you know, it might be working with your leaders to determine that you might start that small group with that population and that they have a Sunday, you know, and then another Sunday might be for, you know, children and families. Um, so I, I think that's a decision for the congregation. Um, you know what your needs are. And if that's a population that you really have identified as a population that has been vulnerable um, and isolated, it might be that that's the population that you start with. Thank and remember you. that we're talking about doing this in conjunction with virtual so that there's still opportunities for various groups to worship. So, you know, while you may have um, that elderly group or that group that is more at risk in the building, you're still um, broadcasting your uh, service virtually so that others are still able to participate in worship at the same time, just not at the same location. And so I, I just wanted to add to that, that I know because this is such a difficult question, it is, um, I have heard, uh, the decision why some churches are choosing to just um, hold off on worship. So, so those decisions and that division doesn't happen. Um, and, 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 and so that's another option to say we're all in this until we're all in this. So. so there's a question about resources available to approach stewardship during a longer distance worship period. Um, we do have a group of people working. Uh, there's a small group of people that have been working on stewardship issues, stewardship chairs are meeting. Um, David Cleaver Bartholomew from our staff and Mary Nelson from our staff are gathering people to share best practices around stewardship. We had an initial finance, finance Zoom meeting a couple weeks ago. We're doing another one of those next week to sort of attend to the stewardship and financial questions. So we will attempt to address that. What about the use of outdoor property for food and clothing collection and distribution? We do know that's going on. So again, the question of how um, those who are serving others um, are practicing physical distancing, are wearing masks, gloves, um, making sure that they're observing all those guidelines, I think, um, using outdoor space for that. Certainly churches are beginning to talk about with the weather getting nicer, maybe, um, with the weather getting nicer, they might want to gather for outdoor worship. Any thoughts about outdoor worship from the team? We had discussed 
some of outdoor worship and some of the same processes that to evaluate ability to worship in person would come into play in planning any outdoor worship, uh, still maintaining physical distancing, still having masks, still following the basic recommendations would be important. In addition to that, it would be very important to check with your local officials, your police and fire to find out if there are any uh, practices that you need to follow or if you need a permit, there may be guidelines that you need to consider when, when planning. Um, facilities, things of that nature. It, the list is probably almost as long as with in-person worship for the things that you would likely need to consider to plan on and to process in order to do that safely. Uh, I would also say when it came to the thrift store and food practices that uh, some of that has had come our way. And I think that what the recommendation of the team was, if I'm not mistaken, Kelly, was that uh, people, uh, the, the groups that do a lot of thrift store work like the Salvation Army and Goodwill and so forth are making some recommendations for how to safely handle thrift. And, and those are resources that we need to continue to develop and have available. And I would say when it comes to food service outside or inside that you would also really want to lean on your local um, health agent to determine if you can take whatever guidelines you had or, or, or permissions you had before and apply them to a new situation and during COVID-19. So there is a question, um, someone's requesting Tiffany to flip phase three on the screen again for a moment. I think that the person has a specific question about phase three. Is that something you can pull up quickly while, here we go. So is it now that it's on the screen, I'll ask um, the person, Vicki, um, what question do you have about that? And while we're waiting for that question maybe to emerge on Facebook Live, um, the, Nicole Grant Youngpin says the Windsor Food Bank is not accepting food donation, gift cards and money only. And as always, um, I think she makes a great suggestion that we would also concur with. It's best to check with your local folks um, yeah. to see what they do before you start a drive. Obviously, you, you, want, you want that to be a part of that. Um, Wendy Miller Ol Olapod says that um, most organizations are not accepting clothing right now. So again, this is all before you start something within your congregation out of goodwill and wanting to do something, quote unquote, it's always good to check with local, you know, whatever agencies you'd be working with in your own communities to see what they, they're looking for and what they, what they desire. Um, the tech that's needed for live streaming worship is different than what's required for home-based services like many of us are doing. Could you address that? Um, Paul Brian Smith asks, and we will address that, Paul, tomorrow in the digital ministry meeting. That's sort of the teaser to get you to come back tomorrow at two o'clock for our conversation. We realize that probably for a period of time, if not Maybe this will be the way forward. Um, we'll be doing hybrid services, live and um, online services at the, either simulcast at the same time or having some kind of feature about that. Um, there's a question about the Newman Congregational Church. I know Timothy Silva is watching on Facebook and you saw the story that they had made a decision about um, until a vaccine is um, developed and in use, they will not be gathering in person. Um, they'll continue to gather online. Um, we may bring Timoth on for um, one of these programs so he can tell you more about that. Um, and so, and, and how they went into that decision, it's both um, in on our website, but also the National Church, the United Church of Christ um, webpage also has an article about that. So we'll think about bringing Timoth on for his wisdom. Um, um, and so, can I reiterate something on that too? Yeah. The first point we make in the introduction is that there is no way to ensure the overall safety of the congregation until there is a vaccine. So beyond that, everything in these phases is based upon the risk 
your church is willing to take to its members and to the community and the overall healthcare system. We're trying to let this be a conversation you can have within frameworks we're providing, but the reality that Newman uh, names is that there is no way to ensure safety until a tested and proven vaccine is available. That also raises a question that I've come up a couple places in the side. What about if the church as a whole or leadership wants to open, but certain individuals in leadership or staff members feel that by opening, they themselves are at deeper risk? Um, and, and would they possibly be threatened in losing their job or have to make a difficult decision because they do not feel as though this, the safety of themselves or their family allows them to be present in worship leadership? Do you have any comments on that? Do we have comments on that? that <laughs> I felt like you just commented. I thought that was great. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I think that what Don said is is right. That it, given our polity, given the reality of our churches and the reality of where we are, and and some churches are rural, um, some counties haven't had any cases. Some um, that to say, don't worship until there's a vaccine feels uh, like setting ourselves up um, to be considered um, to some as not, not seeing the broad picture. But I do think that the reality is, to, as Don said, that there is no, we cannot ensure the safety until there's a vaccine that we know um, has established widespread immunity. So, um, but we're, 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 uh, the United Church of Christ, and um, we're in conversation. I also would hope that, you know, th that in keeping with the scriptures that we began with, that the gospel calls us to be attentive to the least of these in our midst. I would certainly hope that no clergy person nor lay leadership person would feel as though they, they are being called to place their own personal safety or the safety of those they care about uh, up against the, the decision of the church to try to move forward when they don't feel they're, they're able to. I'm hoping that does not put somebody in a position of having to leave the church or leave a job. Um, that I don't think would be in keeping with our gospel, and I would hope the congregation would be able to have a good conversation around that, uh, that, that holds our sense of love and compassion and care for each other in the teachings of Jesus in that conversation. And of course, the conference stands ready to help you those conversations if needed. So we want to thank our folks from our staff who've been working long hours, putting this document together, working collaboratively, using a variety of resources, including the best of what um, other churches, other denominations, and help using CDC guidelines, um, using all the resources and trying to, to assemble it into what we hope will be a helpful resource for, for local churches as guide, guidelines. I think Don has some closing words and then I will um, close us out with prayer. Just reiterate some of the opening words in the converse, uh, from our conversation that we know there is no one date that can work universally any longer, uh, particularly because there is such a variety of geography and a variety within our churches. Um, so we're not advocating for a date, we're advocating for careful consideration in the process and looking at metrics locally as well as, as nationally. Uh, and that based on all of this, our view of the phases we're looking at, the trends we're looking at, the information in this document, we continue to believe that in-person worship in buildings will need to be suspended through at least the end of the summer uh, as we continue to see how this unfolds around us. Kent, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Once again, thank you to Tamara, Kelly, and Kate for their good good work on this particular thing of phasing forward as the Southern New England Conference. I want to give a shout out to next week's program. Next Thursday at 1.30, we will have the Reverend Mary Ludy on as our guest. Um, some of you who've been following Mary's adventures from Spain um, during the pandemic will be interested in hearing what Mary, who's a very captivating, lively speaker, will have to say about the pandemic and faith. Um, so we hope you'll join us. Um, that's a week from today for that. And tomorrow, again, two o'clock, we'll have a conversation on digital ministry about what we're learning 
in, in the way in which some of us have become instant experts, quote unquote, on digital ministry and what we think the future of digital ministry might look like for our denomination and for the way forward. So with that, I wish you God's peace, God's blessing, God's compassion. Stay safe, be well. God be with all of you. Amen.